Have you always been quite financially astute with your money, even at this age? Would this be something uh, that you was aware of, if you like, where your future, to where to put your money and what to do? Yeah, well, I started, I, I, I this is, this is something quite funny because, um, again, when I go back to uh, West Ken and I go back to my, my youth leader um, at the time, uh, when I was 18 and I got my pro contract, the first thing he said to me was, Carl, you need to invest your money. And I was like, what do you mean, invest my money? You know, and he was like, look, you need to buy property, you need to invest your money into property. And I, 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 I didn't know anything about property. You know, I lived in a council estate, I lived in my mum in council estate and uh, my council house. And I was like, what do you mean, I've got my property, I live here. He said, no, this, is a, this, this don't belong to you, this is your mum's house, this is a council house. You need to, you know, you can buy property. And he basically just sat me down and on a piece of paper just showed me what you can do with property, you know, how you can buy property, how you can invest in property, how you can borrow money off the banks um, and use what we call leverage. So he started teaching me all of this stuff that no, and, and it intrigued me because anything to do with making money is, is, is interesting, you know, especially um, coming from West Ken. So, um, so it intrigued me. And when I, when I got my first prop, when I got my first contract at 19 year, at 18, um, I started saving and at 19, I bought my first property. I bought a two bedroom property, which was 58,000 pounds down in Peckham. Now, uh, Tony, who, who, who was my mentor, um, he's the one who showed me, you know, and he, 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 he introduced me to my first mortgage broker, my first solicitor. He went with me, he showed me around um, these properties. We chose the property together. And from that day on, what, what happened was I was quite lucky because about nine months later, I sold that property and I got a check through the door. I'd personally put about £4,000 on a credit card to pay for the deposit at the time for that property. And I'd, I'd uh, borrowed the rest from the bank. And nine months later, uh, I was renting it out and then the guys moved out and I didn't want the hassle. I couldn't afford it anyway. You know, the mortgage at the end of the month, I couldn't afford, but I was making some money whilst they were renting it out. I thought, let me just get rid of this, you know. So I sold it and... Again, not knowing, just expecting my £4,000 back that I'd put in, I got a check for like £28,000. And I was like, 28 grand? I'm on like £1,500 a month, you know, as a professional football player. And at 19 years old, I do this one property transaction and I get sort of like twice the amount of money in and I'd made it in like nine months. So my head at that stage was like, wow, I need to learn about this property thing. And from that day onwards, I started to go to property auctions. I started to go to networking events, property networking events. And I'd go into the training and I'd turn up in a, in a suit on a Monday afternoon. And all the boys would be going down the pub or, or, or going to the calf, and I'd be going off to a property auction. And they'd be like taking the piss, ripping me to pieces. You know, every, every, like literally I would get ripped in the change room. Like, um, oh, who do you think you are? You know, you're, you're buying, an, buying another property. Like literally, you know, no one knew, no one knew that at the time that that was a good, a good investment. But I had experienced it because I'd made this money. So I, I was a believer. Decision to bring you to Bristol City. 135k for the services yeah, of Carl too, Hutchins. Too, too cheap, too cheap. Do you reckon that was a bit low at the time? It's quite a, quite a few quid at the time. Yeah, well, at, what, what it was, it was um, I was out of contract. So basically, I think uh, Brentford had said they want like a million pounds for me or something like that, or half a million, whatever it was. Um, but because I was out of contract and I was still under 24, um, it meant that Brentford got to keep my, my contract, but it actually went to tribunal. So that, I think the 130 was what the tribunal in the end, um, in the end agreed on. So it'd be like compensation for training for, yeah. for the investment that they've put into you as a player. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was a funny one, actually, because Danny Wilson at, at the time wasn't actually the manager. Um, the manager, I think um, Bristol City had, had been promoted to the championship. And the year before that, we'd played uh, Bristol City in the semifinals. And again, I think, like I said earlier, they were probably the best two two games in a row that um, that I probably played for Brentford. Me personally, I lo you know I just loved uh, the away game at, at Bristol and then at home, you know, winning um, winning at home and the celebrations, knowing that you're going to Wembley to play in the finals. Um, and the manager at the time of Bristol City, he had obviously seen me play, and the chairman, and it was actually the chairman um, that actually bought me. Because uh, when I went down there, he said, right, we've got to keep this quiet because the manager doesn't even know you're in Bristol. I want you at the club, so you're coming. Um, so that was, that, that was an interesting one.
How does that work with the manager then? Does it put you on a good foot, on a bad foot? It, was he happy when he first saw you? Oh, you know what? I don't even think he knew who I was. <laughs> no. Um, it, it, it was literally for about two weeks, we had to keep it quiet. I'd literally signed the contract with the chairman. Um, I'd gone down there, you know, we'd done the deal. Uh, we'd agreed, I went with my agent, we'd agreed everything. And then I think the, the, the manager was on holiday because uh, it had been done in pre-season. So, or, or, or yeah, during the, during the off-season. So I think I had to then go down and meet the manager um, once the chairman had broke it to him. Um, but to be fair, I wasn't the only player. I think at that point, this was probably, you know, times were changing. There was a time when the manager said, this is the player I want, this is the player I want. Um, and I think at that point, times were changing when other people were starting to make decisions on these are the players you're going to have and you're going to do the best with them. And um, and the chairman, I think, had got, uh, he, you know, he got in his head that it's his money, he club, he wants the players that he wants and the, and the, and the manager's going to have to do the best with them. Talk to me about your debut for Bristol City. What, what do you remember about your first game? Um, I think... It, uh, Bristol City was a club that I'd played against many, many times. So I was so excited to be going there and playing for them because for me, their their fans were unbelievable. I can just remember sort of like, you know, playing against Bristol whenever I was at Bristol um, or whenever Bristol City came to us um, being at, at Brentford. Literally, their fans would sing for the whole 90 minutes. So, you know... And, and, you know, the ground held sort of like 23, 24,000 people. They were in the championship. So I was just so excited to be going there. And uh, on my debut, you know, first game of the season, going out, I think it was against, um, I think it was Oxford or someone like that. Um, anyway, I think we ended up drawing. Um, we played fantastic. For the first six games, six, seven games at Bristol, we had a fantastic start. Um you know, we was we was we had players at the time. I was playing with uh, the squad was fantastic. We had Adiak and Bai uh, that came in. We had uh, Soren Anderson, who I think was playing for Sweden at the time. Um, you know, we had loads of good players all around us, and the manager was fantastic. John Ward was the manager at the time, and he was absolutely fantastic. Like as a, as a players uh, manager, he was probably the best manager that I've played for. What made him such a good manager, in your opinion? Was it his man management? Was it yeah. his tactical approach? What, what did you like about him? Yeah, it? it was definitely his man management. You know, he the way that he just got his message across individually to the different players, um, the way that he wanted the team to play. You know, tactically, um, he was tactically astute, but for me, yeah, just the man management of respect that he showed the players and that he got back from the players. How long was it? Was he in charge before Danny Wilson come over into the club? So basically, what happened was um, we we started off really well, but for whatever reason, the chairman, you know, at the time, uh, this, you know, the chairman at the time, it, he'd he was already starting to make these changes. He was already starting to do like just crazy things. And what happened in, in what was way? well. Like he he was name it he was coming into the dressing room after the games you know um, I think he he act, actually he was actually a member of Bros the chairman at the time um, that chairman I think he was one of the one of the band one of the drummers or something like that so he was obviously used to being in the limelight and he just wanted more of um, you know just not being not being in the, in in the office he wanted more of like coming into the change room and, and that sort of thing so would he right get involved in the speeches and well he tried to and and and, and this was the line that John Ward didn't like so John Ward was like no 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 you know there's a line that you don't cross and i think what happened was you know he started doing this um and then he made a decision i think we started drawing a few games you know it wasn't going as well as what we wanted but we were still doing okay and he made a decision that he wanted to bring in um, this manager called Benny Leonardson, who apparently was a Swedish manager at the time. OK, so so this is the chairman again doing one of his signings. So he said and he wanted John Ward to work alongside Benny Leonardson. And John Ward was like, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So in the end, John Ward just uh, said, yeah, I'm not going to work alongside uh, this guy, blah, blah, blah. So either it's him or me. And the chairman ended up saying, OK, well, we're going to go with Benny Leonardson then. And this was probably about two or three months into into the season. Now, Benny Leonardson turns out to be like the Swedish women's under 19s manager. 
and the ma and the chairman thought he was the first team Swedish manager. That's how crazy things was at Bristol City at the time. And for the next 12 months after that, it was just one crazy roller coaster ride of managers, you know, different managers coming in. Um, uh, Tony, just, Tony, let's, Tony just, let's just go back a little bit. Yeah. So, what, what was the first impressions like of the new manager? Oh, it was dreadful. And I'm not joking, the whole team was rolling around in stitches, right? To the point where, like, like he couldn't communicate, so he, whatever he had, uh, he, he obviously he had he, he could hardly speak English. So he'd have, he would have like a translator. He had a translator with him. The English he did did speak. He spoke like you know with a quite a big uh, stutter, so he couldn't he couldn't quite get it out anyway. Um, his training was embarrassing, and uh, you know no disrespect, but you know his training was embarrassing. I'm talking like we'd lose a game three 0 on a Saturday, and you know, let's say set pieces wise, you know, we'd, we'd lose three set pieces. Um, on a Friday afternoon, we'd be doing sort of like, right, we're going to do a left footed five aside. And we'd be like, yeah, but we just lost two days ago. We lost three nil and no one knows how to defend. And we began, we're doing a left footed five aside walking with the ball. It was just crazy. And we got, you got experienced players, players like Adi, Adi Akinbaye had been brought in for a million pounds. You know, Tony Thorpe, he'd been at Fulham under Kevin Keegan. He's scored sort of like 50 goals every season for the last five seasons. He's rolling around on the floor laughing his head off. It was, it was just crazy. So, so what happened next then? Obviously, he, he didn't have that long in charge. No, nah, I mean, he, he had too long in charge. He had about six months in charge, which was just too long because by that time, he'd just taken us into the like, relegation sort of like zone and there was no way of getting out of it. Um, off the back of that, though... So, Leon Artson leaves, who comes in? I, I think it was Tony, uh, Tony Pulis who actually came in and then. Um, and he was really good. You know, Tony, obviously, he's gone on to have a fantastic career in the, in the premiership. Um, you know, he's, he, he, Tony Pulis is a top manager in the well, sense of... How would you compare his work to, to that of Leon Artson? Oh, come on. Like, you literally, I'm, I'm not like, you know, my wife could have done what Ben and Leon Artson done in, 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 on the training ground. And uh, that's, that's being honest. Tony Pulis, you know, he, he's he gets what he wants out of you. He says, this is what I want. He makes it clear. You know, everyone knows exactly what's going on. Set pieces, you know who you're marking. The preparation is is on point. You know, um, it was it, it, fun. It was fun to play back under, to play football again. You know, whilst Benny was there, it was like just, it, you know, the fun had gone out of the game. So how how did he sort of depart on what happened with his with his tenure at the club? Yeah, again, it, it was really strange. I think he was there. Um, you know, we were doing we were doing okay. We were doing we were doing well. All of this seemed to happen within twelve months. Within twelve months, I think we went for about four or five different managers. Um, you know, he came again. I think something to do with the chairman. Maybe he fell out with the chairman. Maybe you know. He got a better offer. I don't know if it, I think he went to, I'm not sure where he went after that, but you know, it wasn't that he got a better offer to go to a better club. I think it was something to do with the chairman again and he just weren't having it and and and, and he was off as well. Um, literally, I think that only lasted maybe another three or four months. Danny Wilson comes in. How, how did you initially get on with Danny Wilson? So Danny Wilson to me, um, and I'll be honest, um, I had a first meeting with him because at this time now, the club for me was just was was just chaos. You know, we'd gone through three or four different managers in a, in a very short space of time. I'd put in my transfer request. Um, I think my wife was pregnant at the time as well. So I was like, look, you know, this ain't working out here. Um, I want to I get away. I want to get back to London, closer to my family. Was that to do with the pregnancy and obviously the instability at the club yeah that was it it was totally good I, I love I, Bristol as a city I think is one of the best cities in in, in the UK um the fans I think um you know when when they're on side you know they're fantastic okay um but the the, the club at the time was just all over the shop and then when when Danny Wilson come in he came in off a good back of a good reputation you know he'd been at Sheffield Wednesday and he'd done some good stuff um I had a meeting with him and he said to me right Carl you know I really want you to stay at the club I want you to come off the transfer list blah 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 so I said okay fine all right 
I trained the hardest pre-season that I'd probably, you know, I'd, I'd trained since being at, uh, at Bristol. What, like 300 headers in the morning? Yeah, before, yeah, just before literally training. running in, running before I got to training, you know, in the gym. You know, I, I really got my attitude sort of like back on point because until then it was sort of like, I, I was just disillusioned with what was going on. And then, um, so, so I do all this for six weeks and then he calls me in and then he says, oh, I'm putting you back on a transfer list. Um, he didn't play me during the whole of pre-season. You know, and I just thought, you know what? You're full of fucking bullshit, to be honest. He was, and and for me, that is the one manager, most of the time, most of my managers, the one thing that I've respected about them is that they're straight, you know? And for me, I think, if you, as long as you're straight, if you don't like me, I don't care, just tell me, you know? Did he tell you face-to-face -face that you'd be, you, you were going back on the transfer list? Um, does that have no. a big, does that have a lot of bearing on a player's respect levels for a manager? Yeah, look, the, the, the way my memory from, I can't remember exactly how it went, but I know I left feeling like he's a slime ball. Yeah. And, 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 and the reason why I felt like that is because whatever he had done, he'd done it behind my back. He hadn't been honest. You know, um, he'd liaise with whether, whether it was the chairman or, or people behind the scenes. Uh, oh, that was right. One of his assistant managers uh, was a teammate or a team, a team colleague of mine at the time. He'd then gone to be um, one of the uh, uh, assistants or, or coaches. Um, I didn't get on with him. He was a slime ball. And together, they just sort of like um, done whatever they had to do. And for me, it was just like, look, the only place I can be is out of this club. Because, um, you know, like I said, I respect anyone. It's not, if you don't like me, if you don't think I'm good enough, my ability isn't good enough, got no problem with that. You know, you tell me straight to my face, boom, no problem. But the way they went about it, it was just sort of like all cloak and dagger. You made 52 first team appearances, scored five goals for Bristol City before returning back to Brentford. Was that like splitting up with your new girlfriend and going back to your ex-girlfriend? <laughs> How did that sort of work? Oh man, that was a story, man. That was a that that was a really interesting story. So basically, I just at the time I want I'd do anything to get out of Bristol um, because you know I wasn't playing. I was just wasting away basically. And what happened was uh, my old manager Mickey Adams. He was at Brentford, so he was my old manager at Brentford. He'd gone to Brighton. Okay, so I'm sitting in Bristol, and the manager calls me or, or whoever it was, a player liaison manager calls me in, and he says, "Right, Brighton want you to sign." So to the end of the season, so the three months, I said, okay, great. So, and it was Mickey Adams. So I look in the table and I'm like, right, they were bottom of the third division. Yeah. Or whatever it was, second division back then. Uh, so they were bottom of second division. I'm thinking, oh man, like, all right, you know, I'm, I'll just do it because I just wanted to play football. So I drove down to Brighton, I met Mickey. Mickey's like, you know, me and Mickey got on like a house on fire. He was probably one of my, my best managers. You're like, he's just just a fantastic manager to play for. And he was like, yeah, Carl, like, you know, what we're going to do, we, I trained in the morning on this mud patch. Like, you know, this isn't, this so isn't bright enough today. Are not, uh, like they are today. I was just coming no, to No, no, no. This, this, I think they were training in some, some uh, you know, this is, remember Brighton had that old uh, stadium, that like built stadium. I can't remember what it was called. It was like, you know, pre-built out of, out of uh, God knows, scaffold. You know, and it, it was built there, a stadium built out of scaffold. And um, and the training ground was on, uh, what do you call it, like university ground or whatever. Like but it, campus. It, or yeah, right. yeah, it was a campus, but it was a mud pitch. So we trained in the morning, it was just mud pitch anyway. We get back to, and they're bottom of the second division, and if they lose any more games, they're going out of the football league. And Mick is selling me the dream. He's going like, Carl, you know, we're going we're gonna to get, and he was new manager there. He was a new manager there. So he'd called on all his old players, basically, to come in and help him out. So he was like, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to escape relegation, and then we're going to get promoted next year, and then we're going to get promoted, and... I'm going to give you a contract and, you know, you're going to be my top boy. I want you here for that. I'm going to be here for the next five years, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he sold me the dream. And I was like, yeah, Mickey, this sounds good. But I just couldn't get over the fact every time, like I got away from training. I look and I was like, man, what if we get relegated? We're, uh, uh, yeah, I'm no longer going to be a professional football player. Well, that genuinely was going through your mind. Like yeah, yeah. You're being in the wilderness with it all. Yeah. So we go for lunch and we go to sign the contract. And I'm sitting opposite Mickey Adams. The desk is in the middle. Mickey Adams is there. I'm here. Glenn Cockrell's there. He's assistant manager at the time. And we're talking and he's selling me the dream. And my phone is going off in my pocket. 
So it's going off and I'm thinking, who's this, who's this? And it just keeps going and it stops and it keeps going. I've got it on silent or whatever, or on vibrator. So in the end, I pull it out and I have a quick sneak look down on it. It's my agent. And I'm thinking, why is he calling me? Why is he calling me? So because he was the one in the morning told me, go and sign the contract, just, you know, get it done. And Mickey said, right, what we're going to do, we're going to sign to the end of the season. And then after that, you know, we're going to sign a two-year contract or whatever. So I said, all right. So I'm, I said, Mick, let me just take this call for a sec. And the contract's right there on the table in front of me. I said, and I've just signed it, right? So I pick up the phone, I go outside, and, and my agent's gone, don't sign the contract, don't sign the contract. And I'm like, what do you mean? I've just signed the contract. He said, where are you? I said, I'm in the office. He said, where's the contract? I said, it's, it's, it's on the desk. He said, get the contract. I said, what do you mean? He said, Brentford want you. Now, Brentford are, at the time, I think in Division One, um, you know, league above, they're going for promotion. They got Ron Nodes, you know, new manager, new chairman, sorry, pumping a load of money in there. A lot of good players in there. A lot of my old teammates were still there at the club, still new everywhere at the club, you know. So it was, it was like, you know, Brentford was my, 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 and always will be my, my sort of like home out of all my football clubs that I've ever played for. So I'm thinking, I can't do that. I'm like, the contract's there. He said, go in there, get the contract and get out of there. And I'm thinking, you're joking me. Like, you know, I'm whatever, 24, 25 years old. I think, oh, I don't need this crap in my life. Um, but again, you know, I've moved back to my, my, my place. I had a place in Tootin. So Brentford's like 20 minutes from me, you know. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, Brighton, I'm still going to have to travel another hour and a half from Tootin every morning. So I'm like, oh, man. How am I going to do this? So I go in, I sit down, the contract's there, and I just put my hand on the contract, and slowly I just start bringing the contract towards me, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? So in my head, Mickey's talking to me, and in my head I'm thinking, get the contract, get the contract. So I've got the contract, and now I've, I've, I've got the contract, and now the contract's in my pocket. So now I turn around to Mickey, I go, Mickey, I said, look, you're never going to believe this. I said, uh, fucking hell, Brentford want me to go back there. I said, and they're offering me like a two-year contract. Mickey just, his ears start steaming and he's going, nah, he's like, nah, 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 you've signed, you've signed the contract, you can't do that, you can't do that. And he's going, and he's banging on the table, don't be fucking stupid, Carl, you know, you're my, you're, you're, you're we're best mates and he's throwing all that into it. At this point. He is going crazy. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, I'm just thinking, I'm about to have a baby, right? Um, you know, Brentford's my home team, it's my home, you know, all, all my, all, a lot of my mates are still there at the club. Um, you know, I've got to get out of here. So, you know, I've just gone, look, Mick, I've got to do what's best for me and my family. And I've just got up and he's gone, yeah, but I've got the fucking contract. He's gone, and he's looked down and the contract's not on the table. <laughs> I've got the contract in my pocket. So I've just gone, look, Mick, I've got to go. So I've just got up and I've gone, right? As I'm driving in my car, the... Um, the radio or announced the Brighton radio or announced that I've just signed for Brighton. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, my life is in, 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 is in turmoil. I got in the car, I drove to Brentford, I signed, um, Ron knows now gives me this again. He gives it like, you know, we're going to sign you and then we're going to give you a two year contract at the end of the season, blah, blah, blah. And in the office, what Mickey did say to me, he said, Hutch, he said, um, I'm telling you now, they're just doing it to screw me over. Because what happened was Mickey was the, the, the manager at the time when Ron Nose come in and Ron Nose sacked Mickey Adams. So uh, Mickey sort of like outed him in the, in the papers and all of that. And they had a massive like fight going on between them. Um, and he said to me, Hutch, they're just doing it to mess me over. Meaning like Mickey, you know, they'd heard that I'd go, I was going to Brighton. So they thought, oh, let's, let, let's get him. At the time, I, I didn't pay any attention. But when I actually got to Brentford and I signed for Brentford, I played the first game um, because one of their players was injured. And then after that, I was on the bench probably for about the next sort of like six weeks, just coming on, like playing like five minutes here and five minutes there. You're thinking about Mick Adams' words. That and, and, and his words to this day still go through my mind. Like literally, you know, Ron knows had done that and he, and he, and he did do it. Now, and now I look back on it, he'd done it just to screw Mickey over. To hope, because he obviously didn't want Mickey getting players. That he wanted Mickey to get relegated. You know. Now, irony is, Mickey Adams avoids relegation by literally two or three points that season. Following season gets promotion. Following season gets promotion, and that Brighton team were playing in the Championship right the way up until they eventually, um, whoever it was, got them promoted to the Premiership. But for the next three or four years, they were playing in the Championship. And um, and and I'd, I'd, I'd literally at the end of that three months of, of Brentford, they didn't offer me the two-year contract they'd promised. That's mental. That's so, mental. life of a football player. <laughs>
Your return to Brentford weren't as successful as you had hoped. Um, Mickey Adams' words haunting you as we've spoken about. Making another eight appearances for him, taking your tally of appearances up to 208 games for Brentford. Quite an impressive haul. Um, what, what was next for you? Um, I think after that, what happened was uh, where they'd offered me sort of like, they'd, or, or, or they'd said like, you know, we're going we're gonna to sign you to the end of the season and then we're going to give you a two-year contract. Basically, I'd gone in at the end of the season and, and there was no contract there for me. So that left me a little bit in limbo. And um, at the time, I think my, my first, my first uh, boy was just about uh, to be born. So I was, I, was, I was a little bit in worry land. And it's the first time really in, in God knows, you know, as a professional football player that I'd actually um, not had a contract, you know, or, or, or not been going into the next season without a contract. So, but at the same time, I was probably playing some of my best football as well. So again, I was at that age there where I wasn't really too, too worried. Um, my, I'd built up a good property portfolio. So that was kind of like paying me an income as well. So in the back of my mind, I was always at this point, probably starting to think to myself, you know, do, you know, and, and, what's next for for me you know is is am I going to stay in professional football um but I ended up actually getting a phone call from I think it was Dave Webb uh that Webby at the time who'd gone to South End so funny enough sort of like you know full circle had gone I ended up going back to South End training in that same sort of uh training ground I trained in sort of like many years before and ended up signing for South End um, and under my first manager, David Webb. What what was it like to be reunited with David Webb? Obviously, you know you like to listen to his instructions and stuff. So he must have been been pleased to get you back on board. Yeah, I think look, me and Webby um, had a really good relationship. Just because I respected him, um, he respected me as a player. The only thing I didn't like about playing for Webby was that um, you know you were shackled. You know, so as a player, you was definitely shackled. You know, you, you, you had a certain job to do and that was the only job that he wanted you to do, you know. Um, so from that side of things, it, I, did, I didn't like it. But at the same time, at least I knew where you, you always knew where you stood with Webby. You know, he'd tell you straight up, he'd tell you exactly what he wants and he'd tell you whether you played well, or you didn't play well, or what he thought or how you played, you know. Um, so that, that, that for me was, was fine. That's what I needed. At this point, are you still as fanatical about the game? Are you still as in love with the game? Do you still come an hour early in the morning for sessions? Or has it just now got to a sort of more of a job for you at this stage? Yeah, I think now, um, I think now I, I started to relax a little bit more and actually had more fun, you know, because I think for a long time, I think it was too, too much, too serious. Like, you know, everything I'd done was like, literally, I'd go to bed at nine o'clock every night. I'd eat potatoes if I didn't have, have, have you know, a certain amount of pasta on my plate or whatever I couldn't I couldn't sleep at night or you know it was just so routine Genuinely, that, that, yeah. compul that compulsive yeah 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 it was so routine and I think by the time I'd got to South End now I'd gone through a couple of sort of like you know I'd gone back to Brentford it hadn't quite worked out um I'd I'd, I'd been training on my own a little bit I'd, I'd you know I just started to relax a little bit more and when I got to South End I would say probably for the next 18 months, that's probably the best football I've ever played in my whole career. Um, Webby, Webby was there for about three months and then Webby retired um, as a manager. I think he was having a few, uh, uh, whatever, you know, health conditions or whatever. And, um, and Rob Newman came in as a manager. And Rob, the first thing he'd done was call me into the dressing room, me and... Um, my, one, one of the, my partners I was playing with centre midfield there and we were by far the most experienced players in the team and I say experienced at the time I think I'm still only 25, 26 you know and, um, and he calls us into the dressing room into, into his office and he says look boys this was his first job in managing you know and he'd gone from being a player literally to, to now he's, a, he's the manager he said look boys I need you to help me out he said yeah, you know I just need you guys to just literally on the pitch, just literally do what you feel needs doing on the pitch. So to be his senior players, if you yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I literally take that on board and I'm loving it because, again, uh, where, where I had that great season at Brentford, I'm now in South End. Most of the players are quite young. You know, we had quite a, 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 quite a young squad, and, but we did have some really good, talented boys as well. And... The, the banter was fantastic. You know, most of these boys were sort of like, there were a uh, couple of Essex boys, a couple of London boys. You know, we were driving up. We had, uh, we had a good car school driving up. We had me, Carl Court, um, who went on to play good, good premiership football, Ben Abbey, um, uh, Mark Rule. So we had great banter. We had Tess, um, Tess Bramble sort of um, 
uh, we had, you know, within within the club at the time, it was fantastic. So I I started to relax. I started to enjoy my training. I started to enjoy football. And like I said, for the next 18 months, it was probably my favourite time as a professional football player um, playing football. You played 50 games for the team, scored five goals, as you mentioned, enjoyed your time there. Was it your decision to, to leave the club or was it? did it come through sort of channels that you're not in control of? Yeah, so basically what happened was for the whole entire time I was at South End, I was on a month-to-month contract. And basically that was my decision because from an income point of view, from a wages point of view, um, you know, they, they, they weren't that good, you know. And I, w- I said, look, unless you can increase my wages, like, you know, there's no way I can, I can I'll, I'll, I'll play for now. And, and the thing with, with me and Webby was we had an understanding, like I'm doing him a favour, he's doing me a favour, you know, we'll just get on with it and whatever happens, happens, you know. So I was happy just to sign month to month contracts. I knew I was playing the best football that I'd been playing and, um when Rob took over, I was still signing these month-to-month contracts. And at the time, Leighton Orion had come in and they said, look, Carl, you know, we want, we want to take you on. We're going to double your wages. And Leighton Orion sort of like at the time, they, they, you know, they weren't a, a, a massive club or anything, but they had, uh, I think it was Barry Hearn was the chairman at the time. Um, they had a couple of young new managers who were really sort of like enthusiastic. I went and met Barry Hearn and he was enthusiastic about what, getting the club promoted. What was promoted. Barry Hearn like? What was your first impressions of him? Oh, he was uh, he was a nice guy. He was a good guy, you know. He he, he knew exactly what he wanted, you know. He knew um, uh, he knew what he wanted for the club. He knew where he wanted to take Leighton Orient. He was a shrewd business guy, definitely. You know, everything was about business. Um, but yeah, he was he, he he was a good guy, and um, and I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave South End. But I went in to see Rob, and I said, "Look, Rob, I said I'm on a month to month contract. I said if I get injured, you won't pay me next month." You know, I said, what, what can we do about it? And, and at the time I was literally, you know, we were, South End, we were doing really well. We were playing great football. Um, and I, I think personally, I was I was getting man of the matches every, every other week. And, um, and Rob just sort of like, just turned around and said, oh, I can't do nothing for you. Which for me was really disheartening because I knew that he was giving other players contracts. You know, there were other players in the team that he was giving contracts to. He'd asked me to be the senior player, be this player on the pitch, be this, and I'd done everything. And in return, he just turned around and said, oh, there's nothing I can do for you. So, you know, with that, I just turned around and I said, OK, fine. You know, you've, you've, if, if that's how you're going to treat me, then I'm off. Um, literally, at the end of that month, um, I said goodbye to all the players and I went and signed, uh, I think it was a two-year contract for Leighton Orient. For, 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 you know, it was, clo- it was an hour closer to my house and... Um, you know, a lot more, a lot more money, and at the time as well, I just had my, my my little baby as well. So you signed for Leighton Orient. Do you remember anything about your your debut for the club? Um, I remember certain periods of my time at Leighton Orient. Um, I don't remember my debut. I think I remember. You know, I think part of the reason was because it wasn't a good experience, um, or all of it wasn't a good experience. Does, does that happen as a player if you've had a bad match or a bad? a bad week, you'll, you'll just block it out and try to forget about it? Well, I think as a player, I think part of, you know, playing week in and week out, you have to forget about what happened last week. You know, you have to look at it, you have to analyse it, and then you have to forget it. Because if you carry that with you to the next game and the next game, your confidence is just going to dwindle, you know? So I think, you know, part of being a professional is to analyse what went on, get what you can from it, and then drop it, you know? What was the dressing room like at Leighton Orient? What were the what were the guys like? How did you sell? So, um, Orient was a, a, again at this stage of my career. Now, I was really about having fun. You know, I realised that the more fun I was having in the dressing room, the easier it was for me on the pitch. And you know, there were some fantastic lads at, uh, at Leighton Orient. Um, we got. Uh, we, we, you know, we got a little group of us. There was probably about four or five of us after every game. Um, you know, we'd go out, we'd go to have a meal or we'd go to a bar and have a drink afterwards or whatever. Um, there was, it was a bit of a split because there was a lot of young ones. So there was sort of like a lot of players like uh, Aaron McLean, um, who's gone on and done, done quite well. He was just coming through. He was only sort of like 18 at the time. Um, 
there was a couple of other ones, Jabo, Jabo Ibrian. Um, he was he was a young one. So you, you had a lot of young ones who had the attitude that I had when they were their age. You know, now I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to be here at that time and stuff like that. And 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 I've got to be in the gym and stuff. And he had a few older players now like myself. And um, Tony Fort at the time was um, good good power of mine as well. Um, he was from up north. And, um, you know, he moved down to London his first time down south. So I kind of took him under my wing and, um, you know, we became sort of like uh, party partners, so to speak. And um, so so it was it was great fun in the dressing room um, off the pitch. But on the pitch, yeah, we again, I don't like to blame it on the managers because I always think that the players should take responsibility. Um, definitely. But there's only been two times in my career when I think, you know, you've got a squad of players there that should be doing much better than what they're doing. And one of them was at Bristol City. Um, and it's also the only time in my career when I realised that actually the manager is responsible because if you've got a squad that want to improve, that want to, you know, work on set pieces because they keep letting in goals at set pieces, but the manager's telling you to go out and, and you know, play bloody squash or whatever you can't improve as a, as, a, as a squad. And I think at Leighton Orient was the only other time in my whole sort of like 13 years as a professional football player that I came across another manager who just didn't know how to get the best out of the squad that he had. What, what manager was that? <laughs> Isn't it? Paul Brass was the manager. So, you know, yeah, it, uh, the, the results show, I suppose, at the end of the day, you know, the results show in, 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 uh, in how good the manager is. Of all the teams you played for and clubs you've been around, what what club would you say had the biggest sort of drinking culture, if you like, or the biggest the biggest social core? Mm. I think my early days at Brentford, most definitely. Um, you know, and that that stems from that's probably because at the time that was the times that, that, that the, the the year and you played. It. Yeah, yeah, that was that that was the era, sort of like you know the, the early nineties. You know, this is the era you talk about Tony Adams. Um, Paul Merson, this is the Arsenal era. You know, we used to go out and see sort of like, you know, Ray Parler and them boys in this, we'd be in the same nightclub as them guys, you know? So that early culture from sort of like 91, probably be up to about 95, you know, um, yeah, something like that. Um, 95, yeah, probably about that. We had a fantastic, but even longer than that, but at Brentford, we had a fantastic culture of after games, you was fined if you didn't go to the bar. You know, literally, you, 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 we'd, go, we'd be going to the bar, then to the nightclub, you know, it was, it was just full on. But, and then we'd be ready to go Monday morning, you know, running on the running track on Monday morning, ready to go. Leighton Orient was, I'd, I'd decided to leave Leighton Orient. Basically what happened was at Leighton Orient, um, again, I had, I had my kids by now and, you know, I had my property company. So I had a, you know, my, I had, um, my property company on the side. I just actually bought a nightclub as well, or, or, or a wine bar in central London, in Soho. Um, so basically what had happened is at this point, I was starting mentally to make the transition between going from professional football player to entrepreneur, um, to business owner. And half of me was split because I'd sort of like, you know, I still wanted to be that player. I still wanted to be that player, but I was picking up injuries. Uh, you know, I was only 28, 29, but I, I would literally every other week I had a hamstring injury or something. And then half of me was sort of like, you know, I've got a young family now. I want to spend a bit more time with them. And I remember at Leighton Orient, um, basically how it all ended was basically, I think, you know, we had, I'd been promised another year's contract or whatever, and we'd lost on a Saturday. Things were getting worse and worse. I was falling out with the manager week in and week out, um, literally, you know, having arguments in front of all the other guys in the dressing room in front of, in front of the other players, which was totally not me. You know, normally I just, whatever the manager wants, yep, no problem, but let's try and carry that out to the best of our ability. But I was at that age where I just felt like, if the manager wasn't going to say something, then I'd stand up and say it in the dressing room. And a lot of the time, you know, we'd be coming in at one nil at half time and the manager would be saying something like to everybody. And I'd be like, well, why don't you just fucking name names? Why don't you just point out who's, who is you're talking about? Because it would be clear and obvious to everybody in the change room. Let's say one person was getting ripped. Let's just point it out and then we can all move on. But the manager at the time would be like, oh, you guys, you guys. It'd be like, well, it's not all of us, is it? You know, <laughs> deal with the problem and let's get on with it, you know. Um, so I just kept finding myself standing up and pointing the f like pointing it out. And if it was me, it was me. If it was someone else, it's someone else. I'd be like, you got to do effing better than that. You know, we've got to do better than that to try and get the best out of everybody. 
Um, and the manager, obviously, we started uh, having this conflict to the point where on a sat uh, we lost on a Saturday afternoon and he was like, you know, right, everybody in, we're going to run tomorrow on a Sunday. And I'm like, look, man, them days are over for me. You know, I'm not coming in on a Sunday. I've got two kids at home. I'm going out and going to take my kids out on a Sunday. I don't need to come in and run like a little kid as punishment. And he was like, you'll be in tomorrow. You know, so we start having this stand up argument in front of everyone. And I'm just like, look, I'm going. So I pick my bag up and I walk out. So on the Sunday morning, my phone starts ringing. I'm getting all these phone calls. And I, like, I'm looking at my phone, it's the manager. And he's like, so he's, I'll pick up the phone. He's like swearing down the phone at me. You know, where are you? You're supposed to be here, fucking hell, blah, blah. And I said, look, I told you I'm not coming in. I said, in fact, I will come in. I'll come and see you now. So I got in my car. I was so pissed off. I got in my car. I drove sort of like all the way up to Leighton, um, took all my kit in, went out on the pitch, dumped, my, dumped all my kit down and said, look, you know what? I'm done. Keep my kit. I'm out of here. And, and, and that was it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you can keep it. I'm done. He said, I'm going to find you. I said, what do you mean you're going to find me? Do you not understand? You can keep all my money. You, don't, you, can, you, you can find me as much as you want. And I get up and I turn around. I just get in my car and I drive home. Well, so you effectively terminated your own contract? That was it. I was done. I just went, That's, I, I'm uh, just finished. And that, in my head, I went home and told my missus, oh, by the way, I no, don't play football anymore. She was like, you fucking what? <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Um, but I think somewhere in my head, you know, I'd been making that transition. You know, I'd be making that journey. Part of that was having a young family that I wanted to spend more time with. Part of that was I wasn't enjoying the position. I wasn't enjoying the, the, the confrontation I was having week in and week out with the manager. I didn't like undermining other, other you know, undermining the managers and having this sort of like major fallout. And, um, and part of it was I was ready to start this new journey in my, in my life. It's quite a brave decision to make at the age of 29, no matter what journey you, you've got ahead or what lies ahead to to suddenly retire from a job that you've done literally your whole adult life it's a brave decision I think like I said I always look back on that moment and it wasn't something that I, I I'd planned sort of like previous I think I've always been very hot-headed in a sense of you know I'll make a decision just on the spur of the moment and I think that's um you know just Growing up, how I grew up, you have to kind of like, you know, just make decisions and move with them quick, you know, and um, I'd always, I've always been like that. So I think subconsciously it was something that had been happening. You know, it had taken me probably probably 12 months in my mind. It had been happening, but it had taken to, to that moment for me to say this is this is the time. After you know? the heat of the moment had calmed down and what was said had, had sort of worn off. Did you did you regret that decision? No. Genuinely? No, no. I never never, never regret that, um, that decision. The reason being is because it opened up the doors to everything else that I wanted to go on and do in my life. Um, you know, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be a professional footballer um, forever. And one of the key things that I'd always said in my life is that I, I'm, I want to have control of my financial future, you know, because I'd gone through so many times of contract negotiations, you know, this is what I want in wages, but I'm getting this, you know, um, a big game coming up, but you're not selected, you know, maybe, and, and all of these times I'm thinking, oh, I've got to have some control in the future. I've got to have control of what goes on. So I think that decision was a decision that then propelled me into me now being in control of, of, of what I do next in my life. At this stage in your life, you're entrepreneur, property developer, um, do you help other footballers invest their wealth and income as well into into business? Yeah, so so basically what happened was when I left football and I started full time, then what I started doing is working with other football players, um, basically helping them, showing them. Some, some players just wanted me to basically find properties and invest their money for them. Yeah. You locate the property, tell them how much the cost is and, yeah. and then work out what the prof profit and percentage is. Yeah. So some players wanted me to do everything for them. Um, other players just wanted to learn about how do they do it. So that's when I started doing courses and trainings. Um, so I basically it started off like one to one, sort of like go down after training, meet one of my play meet one of my colleagues and and basically, you know, a pen and paper, show him how I'm doing things. Yeah which then developed into rooms of sort of like five and rooms of 10. Now I'm, uh, my, my training company now teaches sort of like, you know, uh, everybody and anyone basically, you know, we could have a room of 200, you know, training people on how to do property, what to do and, and, and how that works. How proud are you of your sons, Marley and Jaden? And I know 
um, potentially following in your footsteps, whether that be football or entrepreneurship. Um, how, how pleased are you with their progress? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mega, mega, mega proud of them. Now, the reason being is because, um, let's say Marley, for instance, you know, he's very talented in lots of different areas. Um, he got a contract at Southend, you know, and then he done for me, which is one of the biggest decisions. He made one of the biggest decisions that as a 16, 17 year old kid, um, you know, when, when your whole life, everyone's saying to you, oh, you're going to be like your dad. Yeah, you're a brilliant player. You're going to be like your dad. You've got talent. You've got this. You've got that. To then turn around and actually take time out and say, you know what? This isn't actually making me happy. This isn't actually where I want to go. This isn't actually the path that I actually want to lead. To actually be able to go sit down, have a conversation and turn around and, and say, look, dad, look, mum, actually, you know, I don't actually want to do this. I've been doing this. I realise I've been doing this because of that's the, the 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 vacuum that I've been kind of sucked into, but now I've been now I'm doing it. I actually realise I enjoy doing other things, you know. So Marley's now he's going to be 19 next week, and he made that decision at 17 that football wasn't his path. Now he's gone into you know he's got his own business ideas that he wants to do. He does um, uh, you know he's very creative, so he's, he's makes lots of different videos and his his, his music uh, he DJs and he you know he's got much more of a creative vibe about him um so yeah he's the one thing that I try to instill in both my children is you know to be able to make decisions for you you know don't follow anybody else don't do you know what everybody else is saying you know know what it is you want in life and then and then go for it you know um Jaden uh the younger one he's just finished his GCSEs he's um he is 100% sort of like, you know, he wants that football goal. You know, he wants that football dream. Um, that's that's him. He's kind of like in the gym. He, he reminds me of me when I was 16 years old. You know, he'd be out seven o'clock in the morning doing a run, then go into the gym, then go in football training, then coming back, then getting a massage. Like today when I left, he was he'd booked his own massage. You know, he'd go out and, and then from an entrepreneurial side, he's running nightclub parties. You know, he's he's got last... Um, uh, uh, a couple of months ago, he had 500 people in a in a nightclub. He'd hired out a nightclub. He had 500 people. He'd hired the DJs. You know, so again, what I want to do for both of them is just show them that they've got to, they can take whatever they want in life and make it happen. You know, themselves. They don't need to rely on anyone else. As long as they've got that goal, that dream, that ambition, you know, that's that they can make that happen. Do you think you'll ever go into football coaching or football management at any level? Is that something you've thought about? You know what? I used to think about it every day um, in a sense of all my coaches, like especially sort of like my coaches from a young age, have always said, Carl, you, you, one day you're going to be a great manager, you know? And what happened was, you know, I set up, when my, when my kids were young, when they were sort of like six, seven years old, um, they were playing for, I think, Worcester Park at the time, and then the club folded or the manager left. I jumped in and uh, alongside a couple of other parents, we set up a club. Um, so a local club. So it went from having seven kids um, in this local club to having like over a hundred kids in different age groups. And I was the chairman, the coach, you know, the coach on a Saturday, the coach on a Sunday, the chairman of the club alongside a, a, a group of parents. And I've done that for the last 10 years. That's brilliant. Um, now, what happened was now, obviously, with Marley now, he's, he's gone right the way through the levels. Jaden's gone right the way through the levels. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I need to pass this over now to someone else because for 10 years, you know, I've been doing this. No, no nights out on a Friday anymore and stuff like that. Um, now, I think what that done, though, because I was coaching at Chelsea, uh, doing the Chelsea Academy um, as well, and it just got all too much. So I stopped doing the Chelsea Academy. I had my business I was running. I was running this, other, uh, obviously, the kids club and stuff. And... I think that time has now m maybe just gone past, you know, because I think to be a really good coach and if I was going to coach at a certain level, I'd want to coach at the highest level I could coach if it was um, uh, professional. And I think my business, what I do in business and the dedication that I know I'd have to put into coaching, I don't think I could do the both. Will we see you doing more digital content with your business in the future then? Is that some videos and stuff that, is that a route you're going to go? Oh, definitely. I think um, what I've done, I took six months out. I've created an online platform, um, an online pro uh, property training program. So that's sort of like um, modulized, you know, there's over 70 videos in that in, in, in that module. So that's an online um, training program that people can sort of like purchase and, how do and, and I, do that. How do I purchase that, Carl? Uh, I've got you here. How do you purchase that right now? You go to um, 
we've got free training. So basically, the free training is uh, hhwealthacademy.com. And if, hhwealthacademy.com. Yeah. So if you go to there, you can click on and that will show you some different um, trainings that you can come to. You can download some free information. And then also with the uh, the online training, basically, um, you can just email us basically and we give you send you a link um, at hhwealthacademy.com. Uh, we send you the link for uh, the online training and what and, and some videos on what it's all about and what you're going to get from it. Sounds very interesting. Like I said, thank you very much for giving us some of your time today. My pleasure. It's been a great pleasure to go over your career. I hope we, we've done it justice a little bit. And uh, yeah, thank you yeah, very it's much. Been, it's, it's been great to um, look back on, on some of those times I probably haven't spoke about for, for years and years. So yeah, thanks for, thanks, thanks for having me. Top man, Carl. Thank you very much. 